this is sort of a follow on expanded presentation to one I gave last fall. At the time, we hadn't announced what's now called Watson X. And so it's more talking about uh, internal view. But now that this thing has been announced publicly, I, I can tell the fuller story. So first, I like to always ground this in the history of AI, um, because the understanding the history of AI at IBM helps make it clear why inner source was a necessary component for us to get to a, a platform. So as some of you may know, AI is actually fairly, you know, it's, it's almost as old as digital computing. It was founded as a field in 1956. And IBM has always been a strong participant in the evolution of AI with some fundamental innovations like speech technologies, natural language processing technologies, and then some really high profile events like beating Kasparov in chess with our deep blue computer and then beating the Jeopardy champions with our original Watson system. The Watson system that won Jeopardy, that happened in 2011, and that represented an inflection point for AI in the industry. Prior to that time, the joke about AI had been that it's always perpetually 10 years from being useful, but um, not the Watson Jeopardy system per se, but the technology that enabled the Watson Jeopardy system, advancements in deep learning, advancements in the ability to store and process massive amounts of data, really caused AI in the industry to have an inflection point where people started to seriously put it to work. And lots of people came to IBM in the 2010s because of Watson Jeopardy, because of our history with AI. And what resulted was a, a sort of let a thousand flowers bloom approach in terms of starting new vertically oriented divisions, in terms of acquiring AI startups, and in terms of starting new organic products. Uh, this area was characterized by some good successes, but also some failures. But internally, there was just a tremendous amount of fragmentation. So then in 2019, we acquired Red Hat and embarked upon a new strategy. Well, it was, the, it was new then called the hybrid cloud and AI strategy. And the goal was to really shift from being a company with many products to a company with a real platform that addressed what we consider the two most urgent technical problems of this current era, the hybrid cloud problem, and then the AI problem. So that was that we started in 2019. Now I'm going to zoom forward to the present and talk about what we just announced, not as a product pitch, but so you can kind of see the end of the story. And then I'll work backwards and say how Intersource helped us get there. So the, the reason that we and so many others are interested in the AI market is because it's just going through this period of hyper growth um, in terms of people trying to infuse it into actual applications, actual mission critical workloads. So it's doubled in the past five years. And it's also a real challenge for companies to adopt because it brings along with it all of the problems of the software engineering life cycle, but a whole new set of problems from the data and AI life cycle. And every day we see news articles about new advancements in AI. The downside of that is it's just really hard to keep up. And so long story short, businesses really want to adopt AI, but they really struggle to adopt AI in meaningful ways that differentiate them. So these are the three fundamental things we tell leaders they should think about with AI. How do you actually create competitive advantage? Like how do you put your expertise, your data to work so that you can differentiate your products and services versus your competitors? Then how to apply it across the business um, improving every, every single enterprise workflow through infused intelligence. And then finally, how to advance trustworthy AI? Because as you may know, AI brings a lot of power, but like any technology, it also brings along a lot of potential problems if you're not careful and thoughtful about it. And since IBM is focused on helping people deploy um, mission critical workloads, enterprise workloads, government workloads, it's not okay for it to be right some of the time. It has to be very trustworthy. So the, the real market moment in the last year was the, you know, OpenAI's introduction of ChatGPT. It's very much like the original Watson Jeopardy system in that through bringing forward a very compelling application, 
it really awoke many people's consciousness about how powerful this technology was. Prior to ChatGPT, people in the AI research community were aware of the amazing advancements, but people in the broad world were not aware of it. And so just like Netscape helped people get their head around the power of the web, ChatGPT helped people get their head around this new class of AI that we now call foundation models. So in 2017, Google published a paper about a new AI architecture that they said would, would lead to much better results. And those are now called foundation models. In the paper, they were it was called the transformer architecture, but we've standardized on the name of foundation model. And so if you look at this picture, the, the interest in ChatGPT was because it was simply the best chatbot anybody had ever, had ever interacted with, and its performance just blew people away in terms of the things it could do. But there's there's actually a bigger concept. This transformer architecture helps can help you with, with chat use cases for sure, but it's just a generally better and more powerful architecture for most AI tasks. And while most people think about AI in, in terms of text, you can actually um, work with any data modality like IT automation data, um, AI ops data, uh, um, chemistry, geospatial data. And so what we're trying to do is provide a platform that allows you to work with all those different data modalities so that you can use AI for productive purposes. So I'll skip this slide. So in May at our Think Conference, we announced Watson X as our new AI and data, data platform with a particular focus on foundation models. And these are the three basic parts of it, Watson X AI, Watson X data, and Watson X governance. So if you look at that Watson X AI part, that's now where I'm gonna tell the backstory of how Intersource was so critical to making this actually happen. So everything that you just saw, that's sort of the, the marketing material and the result of four and a half years of work. But now I wanna tell the backstory and the role that Intersource played. So four years earlier, 2019, so we embarked on this platform era for IBM AI in 2019, and I, I had the privilege of getting to play a leadership role back in those early days, uh, because in the 2010s, I had led the successful rollout of new development tools at IBM, GitHub Enterprise, Slack, Travis CI. And so what our leadership said is that in order for us to be successful as an AI platform company, we must be the first best adopter of our AI platform in our IBM products. And so the challenge to me was, you just got 75,000 IBM developers to change their tools, now get them to embed Watson and infuse AI with two goals. So the first one is that differentiation that I talked about before. So just like now, nowadays, we try to help our customers differentiate their products and services with AI so too should we differentiate our products with AI. And the second thing is the drinking our own champagne point. Um, if we don't love our platforms, how can we expect anyone else to? So let's be the first best adopter of our AI platform and have our products be the best reference that this stuff really works. But there were two massive inhibitors. Uh, my assumption was that the problem was is that people weren't doing AI but the problem, which I'm sure folks who are in an inner source community will appreciate, is that the problem was is that everybody was doing it in different ways. And then the second one is more of a technical problem, which is in the 2010s, we'd been focused on public cloud services in the IBM cloud. But now that we were shifting to hybrid, we needed a stack that could run anywhere. So we needed portability. So the fundamental problem in 2019 was that we lacked a stack. So after four and a half years of thinking about this problem, my conclusion is that the ultimate problem with being a successful platform provider and this, whether you're a tech company like IBM or a car company who wants a platform for your portfolio of cars, the biggest problem is fragmentation. So what you see in this chart is a visualization of major natural language processing investments at IBM from 1990 to 2016. The yellow lines represent research investments and the blue lines represent product investments. 
And it's not important that you understand what every name is on the chart here. But what you should take away from this chart is that IBM had been investing in NLP for a long time. We'd been making many investments, but the problem is, is that the lines don't converge. And with the lines not converging, what it means is that each line represents a distinct stream of investment, expertise, and innovations. And so if, for instance, this top line, SPSS Text Analytics, makes a million dollar investment in natural language processing sentiment analysis in 2013 and does an amazing job, that's great for them, but it doesn't help anyone else. And so the problem with this is that from an economic perspective, if you're the CEO of IBM, you say, I'm investing a ton of money in natural language processing. Why isn't it the best in the world? And this picture is the answer. Because if you're fragmenting your investments, even though you might be investing $100 million in aggregate, you might only be investing $5 million on average. And so you're really fragmenting your impact. So in 2019, a peer of mine, Dakshi Agrawal, who's the CTO for AI for IBM, said that we need a common NLP stack for the company that aggregates the best of IBM's NLP into a common stack and open source into a common stack and provide standardization for key NLP features. And so between 2019 and 2020, the picture changes from this fragmented picture to this coalesced picture. And so in the middle there is the common natural language processing stack, which we called Watson NLP. And now you see that the research investments are now uh, funneling into Watson NLP and the Watson NLP capability is then going downstream into about 15 IBM products. So how did we do this? Well, of course, the answer is Intersource. We, um, we looked around the industry and said, where, what are the really great platforms and how do they come to be? And for the ones that were most interesting in the enterprise space, like Linux and Kubernetes, they all had an amazing open source ecosystem. And so we then studied those products that had become entrenched platforms in the enterprise space as open source. And what we came to understand is that they all had three fundamental characteristics. The first one is that they had a great developer experience so that it was very easy to adopt, get value from, and start to use. The second thing was that they had a very robust community that helped people get started, that helped people get unstuck, and that helped people think about how best to make use of the technology. And then finally, they had a great contributor experience um, and a supporting highly modular architecture that made it possible for people to come in and have a lower learning curve to start to make a contribution to the open source stack um, versus a big monolithic code base that's hard to understand. But the problem for us was that in 2019, our AI portfolio was almost entirely proprietary. So it wasn't feasible back then to jump to open source, to like rebase everything on an open source foundation. But some of our, our senior team members like Michaela Eller and Olivia Bujek learned about Intersource and learned about Intersource Commons and started bringing that back to IBM. They said, we can't do open source right now, but what we can do is embrace Intersource and unite, start to unite the IBM technical community around common AI stacks. The, the reasons that we settled on probably won't surprise anybody here, but I'll go through them just in case it's a different framing. So the first thing is differentiation requires focus. We have really tough competitors in the tech industry like Microsoft and OpenAI. And if we're internally fragmented and if we're internally diffusing our investments, how can we hope to compete with such great companies? And so by adopting the common core tech, we actually free up the product teams to focus on their differentiating capabilities and experience rather than reinventing the wheel or reinventing an NLP stack. The second thing is the power of community and the collective brain power. So none of us is as smart as all of us. If you look at the stack that we got to, it's, um, it brings together innovations from open source, from different product portfolios, because what we found is that each of those products was solving real problems. Um, they weren't 
making up problems to solve. They were reacting to marketplace needs and realities of running technology at scale. For instance, the, the inference server that's part of the common stack now came from a product called Watson Assistant, which is our chatbot product. And to think about the sort of scale a product like that needs to run at, um, Watson Assistant was used to help uh, use chatbots to help people get COVID vaccines in the when the COVID vaccines first became available. So it had to just serve millions of, of requests. And so we take that technology that's been uh, kind of proven its worth in the real world and bring it back to the common stack. And then finally, 95% right is more than 5% wrong. There was this really strange uh, anti-pattern where an IBM team might have a common technology or a ostensibly common technology. But then when another team would look at it, they'd say like, okay, this stuff is all great, but it's missing these two things. Therefore, I have to create my own thing or therefore I have to go a completely separate direction. And so the mindset shift we've been trying to enforce through communication and incentives is that if something's 95% right, the correct mindset is to figure out how to contribute to fill the gap rather than going your own path and fragmenting. So the coda to the NLP story, if you recall, when I showed the fragmented picture, I said, if you've got a picture like that, you can't possibly be the best in the world because you're fragmenting your investment across 10 or 20 different streams. So in 2021, um, when we were part, part of the way through this journey, there was this New York Times article that looked back in the first 10 years of Watson since the Jeopardy system. And it talked about those hits and misses that I talked about. But a really wonderful thing happened. They hired a longtime uh, AI expert and frequent Watson critic, Oren Etzioni, to evaluate Watson. And we got really lucky because he evaluated the natural language part of Watson, which was the first one that we had standardized and brought together via Intersource. And in his benchmarking, he found that our NLP services um, performed at a similar or higher level to Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. And so this was external validation for us that if we can get people to work together effectively, we actually can create world-class AI technology with today's people. So the next th thought was, if it worked for NLP, why shouldn't it work for everything? So between 2020 and very recently, we had an internal project called Watson Core, which was looking across a broad set of AI capabilities that could be made common as part of a common stack. And this is the cookbook that we used. So the first one was we determined what should be a platform capability by looking across the set of AI applications that had been developed inside of IBM and then famous ones in the industry. And we said, what are the building blocks that are always necessary? So we worked backwards from 10 years of experience of building applications versus making up platform components you know, from scratch. So the second part was we selected the best starting points from IBM and open source. There, there was lots of great technology floating around. So we went through a careful curation process in terms of both current capability, but then also evolvability. The third one is, is refactor the contributed code in support of platform coherency. So the problem with number two is that since all of these things were developed in isolation for, from each other, they end up looking quite different in terms of programming language, in terms of API interface, et cetera. And so if we just glom them together, we'd have a Frankenstein architecture. So we did a lot of work on the way in to refactor them and surround them by a common architecture so that everything worked well together. And then finally, the fourth one was embed the AI platform tech into the IBM products, which was the original goal, and eventually partner products. There was just a really big announcement a few months ago that uh, SAP has decided to go all in with this technology, which is a real validation that where we were the first best adopter of our technology, we really built something that is now useful to other companies. And then finally, activate the inner source and open source ecosystems to accelerate the flywheel. So this is a visualization of this. So the three upstreams are IBM Research, where we make a ton of organic investments, then strategic open source, particularly PyTorch, Hugging Face, and Ray, and then Intersource, where we still continue to find innovations that are done by individual product teams, but can be brought back into the commons. And then downstream of that, as of 2022, was IBM products and partner products. 
And this is the stack. I won't go through this. Uh, the key thing is, is that it all has a common architecture because one of the things we found in creating AI applications is that you always end up having to compose things together. Like if you think about the way our minds work, um, whenever you do anything like listen to this presentation, it's not going to just one part of your mind, it's going to different parts that are working together. And we think that's how intelligent workflows will eventually look like when there's a job that needs to be done or more a task, not a job, it will get routed through um, AI models. It'll get routed through traditional automation, you know, quote unquote, dumb automation, and then it will get routed through human actors. So composition is incredibly important. And so what we did was we took a step back and designed an architecture that was designed to compose together from the starting point. So the last three slides, this is a real zoom out on the topics of innovation in general, and then innovation is applied to open source and inner source in particular. So this is a really simplified view of how closed innovation used to work at IBM. So innovation always starts with one of two things, a market signal, like something changes in the world, like a COVID-19 happens or uh, Europe institutes the GDPR. And it creates both problems, but also opportunities. And then the other fundamental force is an upstream scientific or technical advancement, where some fundamental advancement allows us to solve old problems better or solve new problems that we couldn't solve before. So as an example, with AI, we can, we can do better with sentiment analysis with foundation models. And with quantum computing, we can address whole classes of problems that we couldn't address with com traditional computing. But in the, the old closed innovation world, what would happen would be IBM research would invest in a project or a set of projects to try to create an interesting technology to address that market change or the scientific technical advancement. And then in a very slow process, they would do a handoff to the product group, a single product group. And then over the course of several years, it would result in some revenue and brand. But the problem was, is it was too slow, like it was too lossy, especially the handoff process. And also it tended to only help one or two products. So what we realized is by embracing open innovation uh, with both internal communities and external communities is that we can create this mediating middle layer where we aggregate investments, innovations, and expertise. And then again, through the really great developer experience and communities can get those innovations adopted by many um customers rather than just one so as an example if a ibm researcher has a breakthrough with sentiment analysis now by either contributing that to either an open source project or an inner source project it's immediately available to dozens and eventually hundreds and thousands of customers who have the current version of that thing and when they upgrade they get their innovation and so we achieve a leverage point by making contribution much more efficient and therefore scalable and a second one is we make adoption much more efficient and scalable. And so we both accelerate innovations through this cycle, because of course differentiation is fundamentally a factor of time and then, or usefulness versus time. And then we also scale the impact of our investments and our innovations. The last slide is about our transition from inner source to open source. In the early days of Watson Core and now what we call Watson X, we were fully focused on inner source because it was a leap too far to go to open source. But we always saw inner source as playing a role, but not being the only part of the story. And so now we're switching to a hybrid model of both inner source and open source, where we make intentional investments to both proprietary components with inner source and, and open components with open source. And so what we had realized is that if you either if it's if it's prohibitive to go immediately to open source, even that, if that's where you end up, by doing inner source well, you're actually doing 90% of the work that you'll need to do to do open source well. And two examples are the hard work of re-architecting the modularity and investing in a great developer experience and documentation. And so the progression we're making for components these days is this for stuff that starts internally, do the inner source work because that's no regrets. And then if if we decide that it's in IBM and our broader ecosystem's interest for the technology to be open source, 
then do the delta work to make it open source, the legal work, the clearance work, the naming work, et cetera. And then the component team ultimately contributes to both inner source projects and open source projects. And these are our heuristics for how to make those decisions about what goes into open source, what goes in inner source, and which is neither. So first and foremost, if it supports our broad developer ecosystem strategy, then open source. And that's because it's reusable and it nurtures the ecosystem. But then if it's two, greater than two years ahead of the market, then we'll do inner source. And that's where we want it to be reusable, but a proprietary extension to the open core. And finally, if it's product specific, then it's just closed source and that's fine. So that was my presentation and it's been a, it's been a long and fun journey and I look forward to the discussion. <laughs>